Good afternoon and uh, w welcome to our second annual Rosencrantz Lecture. Um, I, I know I appreciate the patience of a few of you. I gather we, ha we um, uh, actually ended up with more people than we anticipated, so we had to set up a few extra tables, so some of the, so some of the service for a couple of you was a li little, little slower than we would, would have liked, but, th but thanks, thanks for your patience and thanks to all of you for, for coming. Uh, the, um, as I say, this is the second year of our Rosencrantz Lecture, and last year we, this series had a wonderful start with a discussion between judges Richard Posner and Mike McConnell. I want to express our gratitude to the Rosencrantz Foundation for supporting this event and to Nick Rosencrantz for suggesting this as the perfect Saturday centerpiece for our convention. Uh, an intellectually sharp one-on-one -on -one debate or exchange between two highly prominent legal theorists. We are once again honored to have two of the country's foremost jurists, Guido Cal in, today Guido Calabresi and Frank Easterbrook. And we are also delighted to have to introduce them and to moderate the panel and guide the debate, uh, Professor John Manning from Harvard Law School, uh, who's formerly clerk for Justice Scalia and Judge Silberman. And without further ado, I'm going to call, what, what did I say? Silberman. Did I say Silberman? Oh. You know, I, he, he clerked for Bork, but he spent so much time hanging out with Judge Silverman, <laughs> he got me confused. <laughs> so with it, without further ado, John, and before I misplace you in some other way, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Th thank you, Gene. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted uh, to moderate this debate between uh, Judge Easterbrook and Judge Calabresi. Uh, I just want to say that uh, when I started law school a quarter century ago, uh, statutory interpretation was not a subject that most people thought about. Uh, Robert Weisberg of Stan Stanford wrote, quote, the general contemporary American view of statutory interpretation is that there is not a great deal to say about the subject. <laughs> As a result, nothing else as important in the law receives so little attention. Uh, and today, the world is totally different. Uh, the topic has become a source of energetic debate. Uh, the scholarly world has broken into camps of intentionalists, purposivists, dynamists, nautical interpreters, archaeological interpreters, legal process scholars, new legal process scholars, Gadamerian hermeneuticists, and even a few stray textualists. Uh, and the two scholars, uh, scholar judges on, uh, uh, up here with me today uh, played an enormous role in reviving the interest in statutory interpretation. Uh, in 1982, then Professor uh, Calabresi published A Common Law for the Age of Statutes, which was uh, originated as the Holmes Lectures at Harvard. Uh, and in the book, he dealt with, quote, the feeling that because a statute is hard to revise once it is passed, laws are governing us that would not and could not be enacted today, uh, and, uh, but, uh, um, and that some of these laws not only could not be reenacted, but also do not fit and are in, in some sense inconsistent with our whole legal landscape. And building uh, uh, on uh, the passive virtues ideas of Alexander Bickel uh, and the Yale passive virtues idea. And on the Harvard Legal Process School, uh, Judge Calabresi uh, came up with a way for judges, uh, proposed a way for judges to deal with statutory obsolescence, in part by renovating statutes in a common law fashion as they would common law precedents, and in part by spurring legislatures to uh, say whether they would still adhere to the policies uh, that were reflected in these older statutes. Uh, around the same time, Judge Easterbrook, uh, then at the University of Chicago, uh, what became what I would think is fair to say a co-founder with Justice Scalia of uh, textualism. And, and in one of the first, in, in the first of many articles on this subject, Statutes Domains, uh, Judge Easterbrook explained, among other things, that legislatures adopt rules and they adopt standards. And that if judges treat standards as strict rules and if they treat rules as flexible standards, they are denying the legislature the authority to set the level of generality at which they wish to express their policies. And so <clears throat> uh, he took, obviously, a uh, more uh, strict approach, I'd say, I think it's fair to say, 
to the question of how binding is uh, the text over time. Uh, so you can see in, the, in these two approaches very different, different conceptions. I think uh, it's fair to say that Judge Calabresi writes more in the tradition in which judges are thought to be in some sense partners with the legislature. Uh, and Judge Easterbrook writes more in the tradition in which judges are thought to be faithful agents of the legislature. And today they are going to debate the following resolution. The United States Constitution requires federal courts to interpret statutes as honest agents of the enacting Congress. And with that, I will turn it over to them. They will each take 10 minutes on their honor. I am not timing them. Uh, and then uh, they will uh, each have five minutes for rebuttal if they want. And if after these 20, uh, after these 30 minutes, there's any time left uh, of our hour and a half, uh, I will ask them some follow-up questions. Uh, and and maybe some of you can as well. And so uh, Judge Easterbrook uh, uh, is uh, going first. Judge. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm here to defend the proposition that when in interpreting statutes, judges should be honest agents of the enacting legislature. Now, the honest agents part isn't controversial. It's not just that Hamilton said that in The Federalists. It's that faithful application of statutes is part of our heritage from the United Kingdom, and thus what the phrase, the judicial power, in Article Three means. Constitutional structure tells us the same thing. The president must take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Judges who aren't elected can't possibly have a power to depart from faithful implementation when the elected officials are lashed to the statutes. It would be insane to give revisionary powers to people you can't turn out of office. The trade in Article Three is simple. Judges get tenure in exchange for promising to carry out federal laws. Tenure is designed to make judges more faithful to statutes rather than to liberate them from statutes. The plan is to liberate them from today's public opinion so that they can enforce older rules. Thus, the real question at hand has to be the second part of the proposition. Must the judge be faithful to the enacting legislature or to the sitting one, as Professor Eskridge argues? Or perhaps the judge should be more faithful to later enacted statutes and treat earlier ones as if they were part of the common rather than the statutory law. I mean, that's the capsule summary of the position Judge Calabresi took in a common law for the age of statutes. Though he then spoke as a professor, and perhaps has come to see matters otherwise. <laughs> I think that the judge has to carry out policy created by the enacting Congress, even if later laws are in tension with the older ones, and even if the judge is convinced that the sitting Congress would amend the law were it to visit the subject anew. And I've got three principal reasons for that conclusion. First, our Constitution makes certain procedures essential to law Congress must act by majority vote. Both houses must enact the same text during the same session, and the president must give assent unless two-thirds of each house votes to override a veto. The terms of political officials are limited to two or four or six years after which they must face the people. A judge can't conceive of legislators as homunculi, you know, sitting in his mind who have perpetual tenure and always can revise their work. Only what officials do during their terms counts as law, and then only to the extent that what they do meets the forms of bicameral and presidential agreement. That's why an opinion poll of legislators is not law, because it doesn't satisfy the forms. Even if the judge is 100% sure that the poll reflects what legislators favor, and thus only the actual work of an actual enacting legislature counts. The Supreme Court made this point in uh, West Virginia University Hospitals against Casey. The plaintiffs had won a civil rights suit, and they asked the court to award them not only attorney's fees, but also the fees for their expert witnesses. The winner expressed confidence that even though the statute just said attorney's fees, winner expressed confidence that if Congress were to revisit this issue today, or if they'd thought about it clearly in 1871, they would have provided for the award of expert fees. And how do we know that? It's because Congress over time has enacted quite a lot of fee-shifting statutes, 
and a majority of them provide for the shifting of experts' fees as well.